Standard message rates apply. You can text STOP anytime to leave. Again, text 1A, the number 1, the letter A, to 666. I'm Joshua Johnson. You're listening to 1A. Where do we see this going from here? Even though Alexander Nix says this was the media setup, they kind of had it in for us for a while, I kind of suspected this was a thing, but I played along. The company seems to be suggesting that this was drummed up by the press, but, but what, what does the fallout of this begin to look like? It's very alarming. I don't think stealing the data of 50 million Facebook users is just uh, a media uh, exaggeration, hyperbole. I think the, the company that we're talking about, Cambridge Analytica, their uh, role, as you said, in places like uh, Nigeria, uh, even the United States, uh, uh, the UK, uh, should raise a lot of concern on the Hill uh, in, in, in the uh, United uh, Kingdom. I mean, it's a testament to the age we live in, to the vulnerability of our political uh, systems, uh, whether in you know Africa or in the United States, that uh, this uh, technological uh, violation, the, the stealing of data of that many users through a personality test you take on Facebook, this should not be happening. Uh, from my point of view, Facebook has to answer still uh, a lot. We will see if Zuckerberg will actually show up on the hill or not. Uh, but the company uh, itself, shadowy, alarming, and a lot of questions remain to be answered. Yeah, Steven, Steve, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about, is the willingness of the executives from Facebook to appear. By the way, I should note, we did have a larger conversation this week about Cambridge Analytica and the way that it did these data profiles. Mm -hmm. That conversation included the data analyst for the Obama campaign who explained to us how he built the profiles, and you can hear that conversation online at the1a.org or on our podcast feed. But Steve, what about that? What about MPs in the UK, members of Congress, saying we want to hear from Alexander Nix, we've been dying to hear from Mark Zuckerberg for a really long time. How does this latest move in the story affect whether or not they would actually show up? Well, first, um, this is a great opportunity for openness, isn't it? Because it's when a company's image is endangered, when they're deeply embarrassed, that they are feeling compelled to provide some openness. And this has not been, to say the least, the most transparent of companies. And it's such a giant and influential company, it's an opportunity to learn more. But I'm glad you mentioned uh, Obama's campaign as well. David Rennie, uh, typically insightful, was pointing out that politicians have been slicing and dicing the electorate and looking at individuals for a very long time. I can remember as a very young reporter in the 1990s before there even was social media sitting in front of a computer screen with a political operator in Ohio who was able to do this magical thing to me and zoom in on, an, on a map of a neighborhood and find an individual house and who was in it and how that person had, had, had voted. Uh, now there's so much more information available and the Obama campaign was noted not for going after demographics of people but individuals and trying to figure out ways to move individuals. What's different about Cambridge Analytica is essentially the sleaziness of it, the idea of stealing data and also the idea of boasting of the sleazy tactics as well. That's what takes this to a new level. Not only that, but the kinds of messages that were delivered. Were they about assembling a coalition of the willing, so to speak, of voters, or were they about simply deceiving and dismaying and dividing people? And, 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 oh, go ahead, and they've proven, I mean, they're willing to go as far as, you know, contacting WikiLeaks, as, uh, as far as obtaining hacked emails. I mean, this is just uh, borders on illegality. So it's not just uh, they want to use a Facebook app to get your data, your friends' data. I mean, they're definitely in hot water. I think there's something else going on, which I think the 2016 election and maybe the Brexit referendum and all of these populist elections we're seeing over Europe are clarifying. Uh, maybe for listeners too, which is, for a long time, we knew that voters were swayed by a mix of rational arguments about schools and hospitals and how much to spend on, you know, roads. Uh, but there was a bit of kind of personality too that some people were kind of more generous in their hearts about foreigners and welfare. And so there was a, a mix of personality and facts. What I think is really alarming to a lot of people, and I think should be, is the way that campaigns are now deciding that actually kind of facts and rationality are for chumps that the really smart thing to do is to use tools like Cambridge Analytica's to look for people who are interested in conspiracy theories, people who are gullible, uh, people who are easily angered, 
Uh, that kind of thing, I think, is what really disturbs me about the approach that we saw that the boss of Kim Jong-un is boasting about. I would even add something else to what David said there. You talk about personality facts, you talk about conspiracy theories. There's also tribalism and ever more explicit appeals to tribalism that you should believe this person solely because of who they are and how they're part of your group and you should disbelieve whatever the other person says solely because of who they are. And once you're aware that that is a form of argument or actually of negating argument, you hear it a lot in our political discourse. Don't believe him because he's a Democrat. Don't believe him because he's a conservative or you know, frequently something a good deal worse than that. I should also note, uh, as we move on from Facebook, we've been talking to a number of you about this Facebook story, especially those of you who are saying that you're thinking about breaking up with Facebook, just removing your profile, deleting your data, and no one likes to be broken up with via a text message. But just for fun, we asked people if you had to write your breakup text for Facebook, how would it read? Some of them are very serious. One listener wrote, I retain the right to be forgotten, so lose my name, number, and anything else you know about me. A number of you were a little more cheeky. One listener wrote, hey, Facebook, we're over. It's not me, it's you. <laughs> if you'd like to send us more of your text or join the 1A, Facebook, 1A text message club, you can send your breakup text to 666. You'll also find some of them on our Facebook page. To join the 1A text club, text 1A, the number one, the letter A, to 666 to better protect your personal data, but ultimately, they may be limited. Shama Carlisle Roy is a part-time student living in a remote area of Northern California. She's on Facebook, but she's uncomfortable with its privacy policies. I feel trapped with the uh, site because it's such a form of connection that I've become dependent on. Carlisle Roy spoke to NPR over Skype. She does try and use Facebook's privacy settings but it's not so easy. You're expected to go and try to research it yourself, read through all the fine print, and it's still really elusive. There are a few things you can do. Let's start with apps. Cambridge Analytica got the user data through a researcher who had an app. Apps are one way your Facebook information winds up outside of its walls. When you use an app for a game, a survey, or anything, you're sharing your data. There is a way to stop this. Emery Roan is with the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. Immediately, users can and certainly should go to their Facebook page and check their connected apps. Go to Settings, click on Apps, click on Apps, Websites, and Plugins. You got that? And then you can just deny access to all apps. That's straightforward. Or you can deny access to certain details about yourself, your religion, your family connections, your interests. If you have Facebook on your phone, turn off location services. If it's asking for your location information all the time or when the app is up, maybe set it to only when the app is up or disable it altogether. Or just don't use Facebook on your phone. Still, Terrell McSweeney, a commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission, says there are certain details that will be made public on Facebook no matter what you do. Your name, your profile picture, your gender, your cover photo, your networks, your unity are always publicly available as part of the policy of that website. You could spend all day trying to protect your privacy on Facebook. You wouldn't be able to go to work or school. You'd be spending your day full time dealing with Facebook. Jeff Chester is the executive director of the Center for Digital Democracy, which advocates for privacy rights. Chester does not think creating better privacy controls is the answer for consumers. I think for the average person, there's nothing that one can do to protect their privacy. Chester thinks Europe has the right idea. On May 25th, a new law will take effect. Regulators in Europe are going to be able to come down heavy on Facebook, Google, and the others, require them to get your permission first before they can use your data, and create new limits on the ways that Facebook and Google and others operate. Chester thinks it'll be interesting to see if the new rules in Europe cut back on Facebook profits. In an interview earlier this week on CNN, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg said he wouldn't object to some regulation of Facebook, though it seems unlikely he'd welcome what's about to happen in Europe. But when you apply target messaging to politics, it often means campaigns don't even try to appeal to people who hold different opinions, just confirm and inflame the opinions people already have, often from news sources that only ratify their feelings. A lot of Americans complain U.S. politics have become dangerously divided. But have we divided ourselves from each other, click by click? Leave them some, leave them some.
Facebook has vowed to beef up privacy protections. Joanna Kikis, NPR News, London. Mark Zuckerberg preached this beautiful philosophy that he was helping engineer the world so that the world would be better connected and through our interconnections we would understand one another better, we would become more peaceful. He said that he wanted to remove the friction from life and that's one of the great dreams of technology that we would have these companies that would be able to anticipate our wants and needs and they would supply them to us and that's exactly what he tried to do. He created this contraption called the newsfeed that took all of our data and tried to use that data to figure out the things that gave us pleasure, to figure out the things that gave us anxiety, in order to provide hierarchy to the information that we consumed. You say the source of Facebook's power, Silicon Valley's power, is the algorithm. Is the algorithm the problem? What is an algorithm? An algorithm, in a way, is the distillation of the engineering dream. This idea that you could just come up with an automated robotic way of dealing with the messy complexities of human life. But I think the problem is the hubris that's embedded in that approach. This idea that we can find the perfect scientific solution to things sometimes just gives too much power to the people who are in charge of the system. And sometimes the people in charge of the system, they like to say that they're running things in the name of science, but really they're running a company to make a profit. And I think that's part of the Zuckerberg delusion, was that he presented himself as somebody who was governing his system in the name of reason, but in fact, he was really trying to addict us to his platform and make as much money as possible. He wrote, even as an algorithm mindlessly implements its procedures and learns to see new patterns in the data, it reflects the minds of its creators the motives of its trainers. Computer scientists, you wrote, talk about torturing the data until it confesses. What is it that the computer engineer wants the data to say? The engineer is coming at it with a whole set of assumptions. And there's a whole lot of social scientific work that shows that Algorithms can replicate some of the racial and gender biases of the engineers who create the algorithms. So, these algorithms are not neutral parties in themselves. And they continuously study us and ultimately decide a lot of things for us. And you're frightened that we are outsourcing our thinking to the organizations that run the machines. But what else is new? We always knew that, right? Apparently not. I think that what we see in these recent controversies over Facebook is that we largely accepted Facebook's own view of itself. We thought, all right, well, maybe that data is being used to influence us in some abstract sort of way. But it's one thing to think that in a distant sort of way, but then it's quite another to see the ways in which that data, that process, could be weaponized and turned against us. You quoted in your article that 60% of people, according to the best research, are completely unaware of the existence of the algorithm? It's true. When people look at their news feed, they go along with the myth that Facebook perpetuates that it's just your friends sharing information. But of course it's not that. It's being organized, and it's being sorted, and it's being given hierarchy. And in that hierarchy, there is a hidden agenda to commandeer as much of our attention as possible. We have a hidden agenda too, Frank. <laughs> we, I know you do. <laughs> we want you to talk about free will, which we've been digging into a bit lately. You've argued that algorithms are meant to erode it and to relieve human beings of the burden of choosing. So, tell me, What's at stake here? Human beings are both incredibly powerful and incredibly weak. And our weaknesses are exploited by people all the time. But as society, we constantly try to fight back. And so we create rules. We don't like subliminal advertising. We try to impose transparency as much as possible. And we do these things because we believe in our power to make good decisions in a democracy. 
And so we protect our capacity to make those decisions. You wrote that it's Zuckerberg's fantasy that this data might be analyzed to uncover the mother of all revelations, a fundamental mathematical law underlying human social relationships that governs the balance of who and what we all care about. It's scary to think that something like that actually exists. I don't think it exists. <laughs> I think, though, it reflects everything that we've been saying about this dream of having the engineer take care of us. And you see it as there's this arms race right now to create personal assistance. Each of the big tech companies wants to have what Zuckerberg has called a butler that wakes us up in the morning and that guides us through our day. These companies, because of their data and because of their algorithms, would be able to offload all these decisions that we make over the course of the day. And on the one hand, wouldn't all of us like to free up our time to do things that would provide us with a true state of leisure and we could pursue the things that make us our best selves. But on the other hand, we may wake up one day and we'd say, holy cow, we've given up all this power and we find ourselves trapped in patterns of consumption that we dislike. And maybe the control that we've given up has actually made us stupider than who we were going in because our brains are constantly being commandeered by these notifications, these distractions, by these technologies that have been reverse engineered to essentially addict us. And so when we lose the time and space and the ability to contemplate the world, I don't think we make good decisions, especially democratic decisions. I worry that it makes us less capable of being spiritual human beings. Um, I worry that it makes us less present in the course of our conversations. And I don't think that those threats are actually theoretical ones. I think that we all toil with our addictions to devices. And so do you think we've approached a moment when we can stop and consider what we have wrought or what has been wrought upon us or what we have participated in wreaking? <laughs> Yeah, to me, that's part of the thrilling undercurrent of the backlash against Facebook right now, which is that you have a lot of people who are collectively awakening to the fact that our privacy has been invaded and that we want it back, that we've been wasting our time on this platform. It's exciting to see people taking agency. Or is it just the kinds of things that addicts say along the line of... I'll quit tomorrow. You're, you're right, that people can be delusional and thinking that they've broken the addiction when it's just a prelude to another binge. But in this case, I do think that we're making good arguments about this to ourselves. We've drifted with things for a really long time without really reflecting on what we're doing. And so we're not going to give up our phones. But maybe we'll proceed in a way in which we're a little bit more self-conscious about how we use our time, about the things that we surrender to these companies, and we start to claw back a little bit of space in our lives. Frank, thank you very much. My pleasure. This is On The Media. It's too early to estimate the impact of the Cambridge Analytica scandal on Facebook or on the rest of the tech platforms now mining and selling every nanosecond of our lives. But one can't help but feel that whether through legislation, regulation, or customer revolt, something's got to give. It may seem as if it were ever thus, but it wasn't. In fact, back in October of 2012, I spoke to author, educator, and all-round new media visionary Clay Shirky about whether Facebook's rising star would ever fall. And he said... It's hard to guess how long Facebook will be around. I mean, everything ends at some point. But I don't think that there's any foreseeable future in which Facebook goes away or even becomes significantly smaller or less important than it currently is. Make a list of their advantages. Enormous user base, incredible economies of scale, world-class infrastructure. Advertisers are tripping over themselves to get involved. No one wants to call themselves a competitor. Now make a list of their disadvantages, right? A, a handful of privacy nuts are cranky. <laughs> Can you think of a second thing to add to that list? I can't.
Well, five and a half years later, we figured you could think of a few more, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. The list has gotten longer. You know, the challenge that Facebook faces is because they're operating in a scale that no one has ever even really thought about before. It was an unprecedented scale when we talked in 2012. But it was at least a scale that was similar in size to nation states. Now there are not even countries as large as Facebook. Two billion monthly unique users. If you took China and you added the entire population of America and then you added the entire population of America again, that is Facebook. It's now operating at such a scale that ordinary people can't think through the ramifications of what could go wrong. Aside from just scale, how did they get themselves in this position? I think they played fast and loose with the data with absolutely no consequences. The playing fast and loose question really comes down to legality versus ethics. Every click-through license you've never read for every piece of software you want to use is basically committed your firstborn. I mean, right. no one reads those documents. And this is where I think Facebook is in trouble now, is, is cold comfort to people who regard what Cambridge Analytica is doing as being possibly legal but definitely wrong. I still think Facebook is not going away. They will have to be regulated. They'll have to change some of their business practices. But as many people have been pointing out, just leave Facebook is not an option for many people. The idea that, oh, you can just quit and be part of your small community. You know, a friend of mine is saying, look, I have a rare disease and Facebook has been absolutely invaluable as a support group, as an information group. And the problem Facebook continues to solve is not the problem of helping people talk in groups. The problem Facebook solves is finding people to talk to in the first place. Right. And that service remains intact. There is a degree of American narcissism here. If the FTC were to come to some consent degree with Facebook that said, you must delete the profiles of all US users, their total population would go down by just a shade over 10%. 90% mm -hmm. of that company operates outside of the United States. So let's talk about outside the United States. We know that Europe has imposed certain controls on Facebook's use of data right. that we have declined to do. Right. But of course, they're going to have to be subject to at least the European regulations, and those will have an impact on many American users, or won't it? Germany is now in the position vis-a-vis -vis data what California does for auto regulations. When California sets minimum standards, car makers just say, look, if we're going to have to do it for California, we might as well have to do it for the whole United States. Germany is now in the position of being willing to enforce data regulations that spread over a large enough area because of the EU expansion that it will effectively rein in Facebook for all of us? For all of us. You know, the, the miracle of Facebook is it's the six degrees of separation model now globally. At some point, if I start saying, oh, these regulations only touch the friends of your friends' friends, that, that's a bunch of people in Europe already. And so having to tighten that up will mean that the whole network becomes less fluid for advertisers and more protective of what the users expect out of that service. You always seem to me to be the ultimate tech optimist. You know, you believe that the internet had the potential to be a liberating and democratizing force that would transform governments. The way uh, some people feel about capitalism. Do you still feel optimistic? I'm much more narrowly optimistic as I think anyone looking at this environment would be. Many of the things that I and many other people were optimistic about in the last decade, and people saying, oh, that'll never happen, have not only happened, they've been folded into the background. We now all take Wikipedia for granted. You can't even get a fight going over Wikipedia anymore. <laughs> what I did not know, and I think you know, few of us knew, is this ability to concentrate hatred and being able to magnify it at this scale, I had underestimated. But I will say, again, that the United States is only a small part of this now. And when you see, for instance, what's going on in Zimbabwe or what's going on in South Korea, both of which are having moments of emerging out from under control by autocratic regimes, one 
democratically elected but autocratically minded one genuinely autocratic you absolutely see the ability to coordinate resistance to those regimes as being part of that story so there's a degree to which i can be i think both very pessimistic about my country without thinking the story that's going on in the united states is the same as the story that's going on everywhere in the world mm -hmm. So what do you think? Do you think that Congress and or the FTC will try to take some action? Do you think that this is a Facebook world and it'll always be a Facebook world and Mark Zuckerberg will say he's real sorry and just continue doing what he's always done? This moment feels different, but there is no will in a Republican-led Congress to force Facebook to create a more skeptical environment. I think Congress would tolerate an environment in which fewer things went viral, and when they went viral, they spread less quickly and less far. That, I think, is going to be the net result of this. How do you do that? You tone down the parts of the algorithm that look for the hottest, newest, most emotionally driving stuff. The speed with which the ice bucket challenge mm -hmm. spread through Facebook was a result of a whole bunch of engineering choices about, oh, people seem to like these videos, we're going to prioritize them. You can dial it up or down, and I think Facebook may end up dialing it down. But that will cost Facebook time spent online and thus money. Right. The interesting question, and this is the one that Zuckerberg himself has opened up, is, is time spent online the right metric to be optimizing for any longer? Because in fact, Facebook is so far out in front that they may be able to worry more about whether or not they are slowly wearing out their existing users because they can't double their user base. They, they literally can't. With China locking Facebook out and much of the people that they could pick up next essentially waiting for the economic tide to get them smartphones, Facebook is at roughly the scale it will be operating at for the next several years. So where does it go? How does it change? So it could potentially change in the direction of user loyalty rather than simply squeezing every minute out of every day. It means taking a hit to revenue, and it's not clear that a public company would ever do that, even if it's obviously the right thing, unless the government made it clear that the alternative was going to be much worse. And that's where I think regulation comes in. Regulation is the stick that potentially lets Facebook say, if we just slow things down and we stop treating all conversation as being you know, potentially substitutable. So when you meet somebody at a party who keeps going on and on about the Federal Reserve, either letting that person into your kitchen to yell at you and three friends or giving them a megaphone to reach a million people, that feels really weird, which is essentially what Facebook now does. How do they prevent that? What they have to do is to make what's called the first neighborhood, which is really literally just you and your friends, not the next ring out, be more of a defensive cordon than it currently is. Right now, they regard the first neighborhood, you, again, you and all your friends, as being, here's a list of doorways to Brook. So if anything comes to any of these doorways, we can also get to Brook. If instead you start thinking of the first neighborhood the way it works in the offline world, here's a list of bodyguards for Brook. They will only forward to her things they think she's actually interested in. You end up with much less content moving through the network. You end up with much less clickbaity content moving through the network. But you may end up in a world in which you and your friends have tighter relations on Facebook and the kind of friends of a friends, everybody's seen this stuff, falls into the middle distance. And that's a good thing. Because it sounds like super cocooning to me. Now, there are places where you should go out in public and be exposed to points of view and have to defend your own and whatever else. But those people should not be able to follow you into your home. Constantly demanding that people engage in a conversation they don't want to have mm -hmm. so they become exhausted and remove themselves from the public sphere. So we need filter bubbles because we need some place to talk with people who agree with us, partly to rest, partly because uh, some ideas are better worked out among people who see eye to eye. And we need a public sphere where we can smash our ideas against each other and see which bits fly off. Right now, you see people who have political malfeasance in mind 
constantly trying to take large-scale patterns of argumentation and inject it into the small scale. You see this on Reddit, the giant collection of discussion boards when politically-minded groups go on raids where they simply attack people on other boards, flooding them with people who disagree with them in order to disrupt the ability for those people to talk among themselves. Unsurprisingly, boards having to do with feminism, boards having to do with racism, etc., people trying to discuss these issues in need of social response will often get flooded by the alt-right, not trying to argue with them, but simply trying to prevent them from even having a conversation. So we need small-scale cocoons and we need large-scale public spheres. And right now, they may now be in a position where they face enough regulatory threat that they would start doing things that would voluntarily give up some of the addictive qualities of Facebook in favor of some of the qualities that my friend Jillian was talking about. If I have a disease and it's just interesting for me to meet other people who suffer from this rare condition. You know, that's the baby that you don't want to throw out with the bathwater. But people with rare diseases don't need virality. You don't need things to move at lightning speed across hundreds of millions of people to find other people who are similar to you that you might want to talk to. Thank you, Clay. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Brooke. You're still an optimist. <laughs> you know, I, I you call me a dimpered optimist. <laughs> Clay Shirky is the Vice Provost of Educational Technology at NYU. That's it for this week's show. Things are not getting any easier for Facebook as the tech giant continues to face questions about how the data of 50 million users got into unauthorized hands. Congress wants Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg himself to testify, while the Federal Trade Commission continues to investigate whether the company violated a 2011 consent decree. Demands for the government to do something to protect user privacy raise the question, what might effective regulation of Facebook even look like? With us now to explore that question is Jessica Rich, the former head of the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection. Welcome. Hello, Elsa. Jessica, you helped shape the FTC consent decree back in 2011, right? I did. What went through your mind when you were first hearing these stories about what happened with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook? Well, like many people, my reaction was, are you kidding? <laughs> the facts here of allowing third parties to have unfettered access to user data and not exercising the kind of care for Facebook users uh, that they should were the exact same facts that drove us to take action against them in 2011 and that led to the order they're now under. And can you just remind us what those facts were that led to the 2011 order? Well, it was pretty similar to the facts here. It was all about sharing data contrary to user expectations and preferences. They overrode consumers' preferences to make private information public, including your friends' lists, they allowed third-party apps to access virtually everything. They claimed to verify the security of third-party apps, and they didn't. And they said they didn't share information with advertisers when they did. It's eerily familiar. Eerily familiar. It's all about allowing third parties unrestricted access to user data contrary to user preferences and expectations. And the penalties for violating that 2011 consent decree, they're huge. It's $40,000 per violation. So if you multiply that across 50 million users, we're talking about billions of dollars, potentially, that Facebook faces in fines. Why would a number like that, billions of dollars of potential fines, not serve as enough of a deterrent for a company like Facebook? I really can't answer that question. It must be lack of proper compliance procedures or literally a culture that is not one that really cares about its users. Do you think the FTC is well equipped to regulate social media companies like Facebook and push them to better protect user privacy? I think the FTC is very well equipped to do enforcement on a case-by-case -case basis, which is what it did here and I have every confidence that the enforcement division that oversees order compliance will get to the bottom of this. But is the FTC effectively enforcing if Facebook did indeed violate a consent decree from seven years ago? 
The FTC can't be expected to know every detail of companies' actions all along the way when it is monitoring an order. If the FTC takes action here against Facebook for violating the order, it will be enforcing the order now that it has these facts in hand. And if it uh, assesses huge penalties against uh, Facebook, it will have made an example of Facebook, it will deter Facebook hopefully in the future, and it will be an effective action. What the FTC can't do is police the entire tech marketplace for violations. It does not have the resources to do that. Okay, so because it doesn't have the resources to do that, what more broadly should be done? What I would propose would be simple, standardized information about company practices that allow consumers to easily compare companies. There needs to be a requirement that companies secure the data they collect, and there needs to be a strong enforcer and strong penalties for violations. Jessica Rich is the former head of the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection. She's now a vice president of advocacy at Consumer Reports. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Elsa. In Britain, a special parliamentary committee is investigating whether Cambridge Analytica used the data it got from Facebook to influence the Brexit vote. Today, the committee heard from a whistleblower from the London-based data mining firm, but their request to hear from Facebook's CEO was rejected. NPR's Joanna Kikissis has this update from London. Lawmakers were hoping to question Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, but Zuckerberg said he would send two executives in his place prompting this response from committee chairman Damien Collins. Given the extraordinary evidence we've heard so far today, I think it is absolutely astonishing that Mark Zuckerberg is not prepared to submit himself to questioning in front of a hearing. Someone who was prepared to submit to questioning today was Christopher Wiley, the 28-year-old Canadian data scientist who used to work for Cambridge Analytica and is now claiming its staff use information to undermine democracy around the world. They don't care whether or not what they do is legal as long as it gets the job done. So they are an example of what modern-day colonialism looks like. Wiley told lawmakers that Cambridge Analytica is also linked to the Canadian digital firm Aggregate IQ, which played an important role in the official Vote Leave campaign in Britain's referendum on EU membership. He said he helped set up Aggregate IQ and touted its powerful targeted ads. They are incredibly effective. They are incredibly effective. I think it is completely reasonable to say that there could have been a different outcome in the referendum, you know, had there not been, in my view, cheating. In a blog post, Vote Leave's campaign director, Dominic Cummings, called Wiley, quote, a fantasist charlatan and dismissed his testimony. Charles Creel, who advises the Parliamentary Committee examining this issue, says lawmakers want to understand the relationship between these small data mining companies and social media giants like Facebook. We're talking about data now, and suddenly there's a whole world of regulation that can be introduced around data and the use of data and the exploitation of data and who owns the data and how is data transferred from one company to another. With Facebook shares plummeting, Zuckerberg has promised to improve privacy and better inform the platform's users on what their data is being used for. But cybersecurity expert Emily Taylor points out that Facebook could just shut off data access to third parties and instead hoard the data for itself. What if in the future Mark Zuckerberg decided to run for president of the United States? How would you rate his odds, given what he knows? Meanwhile, Zuckerberg has agreed to testify before Congress on the data breach involving his company and Cambridge Analytica. New Jersey Representative Leonard Lance is a Republican on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. It's one of several committees that have asked Zuckerberg to testify. Good morning, Representative Lance. Uh, good morning, Juno Al. So Zuckerberg told CNN he'd be happy to testify, quote, if he was the right person. Now, you've heard the testimony of other Facebook employees in your time at the Commerce Committee. What do you think that Zuckerberg could tell you that they can? Uh, I think we have to get to the bottom of this whole situation, and we want to know whether uh, Facebook violated uh, a 2011 agreement with the Federal Trade Commission uh, to keep users' data private, that was a consent agreement, and we want to hear from 
Mr. Zuckerberg, who is obviously uh, the face of Facebook. Europe recently passed laws that would do away with these fine print user agreements that none of us really read, and it would replace them with these very clear explanations of how the company is using your data. Is that the kind of regulation that could work here in the U.S.? Uh, perhaps, and uh, certainly uh, the Federal Trade Commission is competent in this area, and um, we want to ask whether uh, it was a violation of a of, a, of an agreement, an explicit agreement that was put into place in 2011. Uh, I, I want to inform your listeners that it is the uh, Commerce Committee that has jurisdiction in this area, and um, in a bipartisan way, the Chairman, uh, uh, Congressman Walden, and the ranking member, Congressman Pallone, have written uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, and we want to get to the bottom of this as quickly as possible, Noel. Uh, let me present you with the opposite argument, right? No one is forcing any of us to use Facebook. If we don't like its data gathering practices, we can, we can quit, we can leave. You're a Republican. Are you skeptical of calls for more regulation? Uh, I think that we should uh, have balanced regulation, but uh, the question at the moment, it seems to me, is whether or not Facebook violated an agreement that has already put, it put, been put into place, the agreement in 2011, a consent agreement that Facebook signed with the Federal Trade Commission, and, and um, that is something that is on the books right now, and uh, we think it's important that Mr. Zuckerberg come before uh, the appropriate committees in Congress, both on the House side, where I serve, and in the Senate. And also, as you know, Noel, he's been asked to uh, come before uh, the British Parliament. Yeah, and, and has turned them down thus far. Let me ask you, if, if Facebook is in violation of the consent decree, what happens then? Does the FTC fine Facebook? Uh, it, it certainly has the ability to do that. And, um, uh, we would be informed by that, we in Congress, because ultimately uh, uh, we are uh, the responsible entity for the American people. Um, I, I believe that the Federal Trade Commission so far has done a good job, and the question at the moment is whether or not uh, there was a, a violation of, of, of a consent agreement that has already been put into place. If Mark Zuckerberg refuses to testify, could you compel him with a subpoena to come to Capitol Hill? Yes, Congress does have the ability to subpoena witnesses. I, I hope it does not come to that, um, and I'm sure both the chair and I would presume the ranking member as well would, 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 would uh, hope that he would uh, testify voluntarily. But to answer your question explicitly, Congress, uh, because we uh, work for the American people, we do have the right ultimately to subpoena any witness. Congressman Leonard Lance is a Republican from New Jersey. Congressman, thank you. Thank you very much. It invited uh, Mark Zuckerberg to appear after the allegations uh, surfaced about the 50 million Facebook users whose data had been abused and exploited during the uh, US presidential election. The committee, in fact, had invited him to appear twice before and been rebuffed. So it can't have been that surprised by rebuff number three. Nevertheless, the lawmaker who chairs the committee said he was absolutely astonished mm -hmm. that Zuckerberg was refusing to appear given the uh, seriousness of the allegations and he urged the Facebook boss to think again. Do, do you think Zuckerberg has anything to lose by not getting on a plane and going over there? Well, they can't force him. Yeah. He could be declared in contempt of parliament um, and he might then have to reason with an official in um, stockings called the Black Rod. <laughs> uh, however, uh, he's not a British citizen, so he can't be compelled. In reputational terms, I suppose it's a little damaging, but he's already suffered a lot of reputational damage on that side of the pond. Uh, it's a, interesting, this, because uh, Rupert Murdoch, also not a British citizen, yeah. was once summoned to appear before a parliamentary committee over the uh, uh, phone hacking scandal. He actually did turn up, but he got a bit of a mauling, actually, and uh, as it happens, a protester threw a cream pie yeah, at him. I, I, I remember that. I remember that. Not but, a happy experience. Yeah, but to, but to that end, right, of, of Zuckerberg clearly wanting to be able to do business both in the UK and, and in, the, in the wider European market, what are the risks of, uh, you know, in essence, by thumbing his nose at the Brits, does he risk a more swift and, and um, substantive regulation of Facebook and, and all the rest? 
tougher regulation is already on its way. Uh, the UK information regulator is going to get additional powers uh, very shortly. A new EU-wide data protection law comes into force mm -hmm. in May with multi-million dollar fines for uh, companies that don't adequately protect data. So the screws are already tightening a bit on Facebook. The bigger threat, I imagine, is the threat to its business model, whether advertisers do shy away from the platform uh, because of fears of a, a consumer backlash. No major signs of that, however, in Europe yet. Stephen Beard at the European Desk in London. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Pat. Facebook is taking more measures to distance itself from the scandal over the availability of its users' personal data. The social network firm has announced it's ending its information sharing deals with what are called data brokers. Julia Angwin is a journalist with the investigative news website ProPublica and author of a book called Dragnet Nation, a quest for privacy, security and freedom in a world of relentless surveillance. I asked her to explain exactly what a data broker was. So data brokers are people who build up dossiers on individuals and basically sell them to marketers. So they started off getting their information from the phone book. You know, they took everybody's name, phone number, and address. Then they would look and find what records they could get to include. So maybe your magazine subscriptions, what car you drive, the registration is a public record, so they would add that. And they build up these files based on public records and data they can buy it's become much more valuable to all sorts of advertisers who want to target often online. So they might know your name because you bought something on their website, but they want to know more about you so they can figure out how to market to you better. So they might buy additional information from these data brokers. And as far as Facebook and the data brokers went, who was buying and who was selling? Um, Facebook doesn't sell its data to data brokers. So Facebook was essentially buying additional data about its members from these data brokers and then putting it together with the information it already had and then letting advertisers come and use both sets of data when they were targeting people on Facebook. We're often told that data collected on us by companies like Facebook is anonymized. Surely if it's truly anonymous, it has no actual value. Well, first of all, Facebook is one of the few online businesses that doesn't really claim to have anonymous data, right? They insist that people use their real names and they do really collect data on people by name. That's different than Google, which does claim, you know, look, we don't know who you are, we just know that you searched for socks. Though there are enormous amounts of research showing that like with enough data, which Google clearly has, you're not really that anonymous because you really were the only person in that exact precise geographic location searching for socks at that moment. Who will this change hit hardest? Advertisers a little bit, I guess, and if they wanted to buy really targeted ads on Facebook, they might feel constrained. That said, like, Facebook basically knows everything about you. This was kind of the frosting on the cake, you know. What they bought from these data brokers was really, like, your exact income, the square footage of your house, you know, stuff that I'm sure the advertisers really loved knowing that, but they don't necessarily need it to do their jobs. And when you were writing your book, you got in touch with data brokers, didn't you? And you tried to have the information they held on you erased. How easy, stroke, difficult was it? Yeah, so when I w reached out to all these data brokers and asked them if I could see my information and if I could delete it, and because I live in the United States where neither of those things are required by law, less than half the data brokers I identified would even let me delete it and only a tiny fraction would let me see it. So out of 212 data brokers, I only got my information from 13 of them. But however, I would just say because you're an international program, that's different in Europe. And so in Europe, most people have the right to see their data and oftentimes correct it or delete it but the U.S. does not have a similar law that would require them to provide me access and deletion rights. As a consumer, though, wherever you are in the world, it's probably best to assume that unless you go to special lengths to delete it, the information that is already out about you is staying out there. Yes, and even if you do delete it, they don't promise to get rid of it. They just sort of say, we won't use it for marketing and maybe take you off of some lists, 
But is that data ever really gone? I mean, the Cambridge Analytica story shows us that, no, it's never really gone. Julia Angwin there, author of a book called Dragnet Nation on the news that Facebook has announced plans to end its partnership with a number of data brokerage firms that hold information on potential customers. This is news out. Here's what could be the worst part. Some of Facebook's 1.8 billion users are actually saying they're going to delete their accounts. Yeah, and that is definitely terrifying for Facebook, and it may explain why Mark Zuckerberg is in major damage control. He's announcing new security measures, he's telling the New York Times and CNN that he's really, really sorry. You know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. Now, what he's not saying here is, please, please, please don't regulate us because that will totally ruin our business model. But that's the subtext. But where did this really start out? This goes back more than two years in the run-up to the 2016 election. Think back to that summer. First, there was the scandal about the trending story, staff not putting on conservative sources. Then there was the fake news problem. Last year, there were a ton of stories about how bad social media is for you and for your children. And then there was more research that showed that Facebook is actually addictive. And then there were the Russians and their bots, and they had infiltrated Facebook. And now we have this latest scandal. Explain that scandal for me. Cambridge Analytica is a political consulting firm that scraped data out of Facebook by getting people to take quizzes, and they also scraped the data of all the friends of the people who took the quizzes, and then they gave the data to people who weren't supposed to have it. And you know, I gotta say, it's perplexing to me that this is the scandal that tips everybody into deleting Facebook. Why is that? This is the turning point because everything that Cambridge Analytica was doing was mostly legal under Facebook's terms. What's new here is reporting done by the London Observer and the New York Times that demonstrates that Facebook knew Cambridge Analytica employees were bad actors. And then also some new information that demonstrates that some of the people working at Cambridge Analytica were really, really bad people because they were actually promising to break democracy. And now Congress is upset and people are turning against Facebook. I would have predicted it was the Russian bots that would have pushed people over the edge, not this one. So the real question seems to be in this, if governments are actually even going to crack down on Facebook. Well, that's obviously what Facebook is worried about, and it's most likely to happen in Europe first. Our government is going to threaten it, but I don't think they're going to find a legal means to do it. While the government's doing that, what about us, the users? What can we do to hold Facebook accountable? Sure, you can stop using Facebook. Yeah, you right. <laughs> delete the app from your phone, or you could stop using it so much. Um, if you are going to delete your account, first download all the data, but also just recognize that Facebook also owns Instagram and WhatsApp, which are the two logical replacements to Facebook, so you're really trapped. You can't get away from Facebook. Wouldn't it be easier if we just use Snapchat? Good God, don't do that. <laughs> Here to tell us that story, as well as other short subjects in Facebook. science, is Nidhi Subaraman, science reporter for BuzzFeed News. Welcome back to Science Friday, Nidhi. Hi, John. Nice to be here. I'm glad you're here. Why don't you give us the details of this latest case of misinformation on Facebook? You've been following it pretty closely. Yes. Um, this, uh, among all other scams on Facebook, seems spectacularly bizarre. And so I spent a couple of weeks looking into it. Uh, essentially, a woman from Ohio uh, called Jillian Epperly, with no medical license or uh, scientific background, was proposing a theory that a fermented concoction of salted cabbage juice made at home could have these amazing, uh, incredible uh, cure-all properties. And so she was saying that it could reverse any disease like cancer, or it could arrest aging, or it could even turn gay people straight. And rather remarkably, it she had gotten about 50,000 people or more on Facebook in a group, in a private group, to follow her and um, follow along to her theory. 
Mm-hmm. In, in parallel, though, um, and as many people as was, were, were buying into this, she had also inspired this movement of people who thought that uh, misinformation like this uh, was had no place on uh, Facebook and she ought to be shut down. So uh, a group of people reached out and said, she needs to go, nobody seems to be helping. And so I looked into this Facebook war that had broken out. Well, let's get into this, this treatment, uh, some of the concoctions she talks about. You talked to doctors about this. I- is it harmful to people from what they say? They say that uh, it's completely bogus. Uh, cabbage juice cannot uh, have the effects that uh, this woman says it has. And in cases where it uh, allows people or encourages people who should be looking to medicine to treat some of their real illnesses, it, uh, it takes them down a path that has no benefit and so it could be harming them that way. Also, uh, fermentation at home needs to be done pretty carefully and so people who don't do that might make themselves ill by improperly kind of making this concoction, you know, just in their kitchen. Uh, And also a high salt content uh, in a juice like this could be harmful for people with high blood pressure and, uh, you know, infants or or pets, as she was suggesting, uh, people give this juice to. So, so it sounds like it, it could be bad for people, and it's probably bogus. What does Facebook say about all this, about these kind of activities happening on their platform? So uh, I presented this to Facebook, and uh, they reviewed it, and they said that it was okay to exist on their platform. Um, the Facebook does sometimes take down uh, content or block users, for example, um, you know, in cases of extreme violent content or nudity or when uh, there's somebody encouraging people to harm to themselves, they take that content down. Um, but they pointed out that uh, as this didn't fall into any of those categories and they said that they wanted to be a platform where uh, healthy dialogue could take place and since there was this discussion and debate happening, um, they said it was fine. Yeah, and Facebook is going to be in Washington very soon talking about uh, what their platform exactly is supposed to exist like it and how regulators might might deal with Facebook. What are, what are government officials saying about all this? So uh, the group of angry people on Facebook, just regular people that I mentioned, they actually took it upon themselves to reach out to a number of federal agencies who are sort of involved in regulating health and uh, science. And uh, so they reached out to the Ohio Attorney General's office, the State Medical Board of Ohio, because Julian Epperly lives in Ohio. They reached out to the FDA, to the FTC, and I also made all of those stops uh, in turn. And it seems like this is a tough question for any agency to really handle. Um, the state, the uh, medical board said they only supervise doctors, and since she wasn't a doctor, this wasn't something that they could handle. Um, the FDA received complaints, but so far has not done anything. The FTC has also received complaints, but hasn't done anything either. Um, it seems to be sort of a tough nut for people to crack because this isn't a product that she's selling, it's just an idea that seems to have caught fire. Mm-hmm. A, a, a very strange, potentially dangerous idea. Well, let, let's move on. And next week, Mark Zuckerberg heads to Congress. Senior Washington correspondent Ron Elving is here to wrap it all up. Hey, Ron. Good to be with you, Scott. You know, we could do one of our 45-minute podcasts on all of this, but here it's just a few minutes. Uh, we'll do the best we can. We'll try. Next week, Mark Zuckerberg is testifying before Congress. For so long, politicians have wanted that buddy-buddy relationship with Silicon Valley. That moment really seems over, doesn't it? It does. It seems the blue is off that rose now that Congress is worried and the country is worried about just how much Facebook knows and with whom Facebook is sharing what it knows. Ron, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Scott. This news broke in the middle of another long-running Facebook crisis, the company's role in the 2016 election. Facebook had said more than 140 million people may have been exposed to Russia-linked propaganda during the campaign season. After years of presenting itself as this open and neutral platform for all ideas, Facebook faced accusations of profiting from divisive ads and the spread of bogus stories. Fake users posting stories on Facebook, videos on YouTube, links on Twitter can be used by foreign and domestic enemies to undermine our society. That's Democratic Senator Ron Wyden at a November hearing laying into Facebook's top lawyer. You need to stop paying lip service to shutting down bad actors using these accounts. 
The Cambridge Analytica story landed with a thud. It was personal. Reports said some 50 million users had their data scooped up, much of it without their permission. Plus, it was political. In secret videos, a Cambridge Analytica executive boasted that his firm helped Donald Trump win the election, though the company officially denies using the data in the 2016 election. Facebook responded that they banned Cambridge Analytica and had already put in place restrictions on those kinds of data scoops years ago. But Mark Zuckerberg, for days, remained silent. How has Mark Zuckerberg avoided the spotlight? Zuckerberg released a powerful denial, saying... In response, people began a boycott movement, hashtag delete Facebook, and painted dystopian pictures of the future where all of our lives are controlled by tech giants. You know, like Tom Hanks in that movie, The Circle. We will see it all, because knowing is good, but knowing everything is bad. Four days after the story broke, Zuckerberg emerged with a Facebook post and a rare round of interviews, including CNN. This was a major breach of trust. I'm really sorry that this happened. You know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data. And if we can't do that, then we don't deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. Meanwhile, Facebook's share price was spiraling downward. The Federal Trade Commission said it was investigating Facebook's privacy practices. Lawmakers were summoning Zuckerberg to Washington. Here's Democratic Senator Ed Markey on NPR's Morning Edition. The CEO of Facebook has to come in so that we can ask him the questions which the American people want to have the answer to. How did Facebook allow this to happen? Ten days after the scandal broke, a news report suggested Zuckerberg agreed to testify. And Facebook came out with a new list of changes to the website. For example, making it easier for users to see what information they share with apps. But last Wednesday came a new twist to the story. Facebook said the number of users affected by the Cambridge Analytica data grab was 87 million, not 50 million. Facebook dispatched executive Sheryl Sandberg for a new round of interviews, including with NPR, once again apologizing and pledging to do better. Starting Monday, we're going to start rolling out to everyone in the world, right on the top of their news feed, a place where you can see all the apps you've shared your data with and a really easy way to delete them. These simplified controls are among the numerous privacy changes Facebook has delivered over the years, often in response to scandals or complaints. Some critics would say Facebook's strategy is an effort to stave off regulations. But in that first CNN interview, Zuckerberg said something unprecedented about this. I actually am not sure we shouldn't be regulated. I actually think the question is more, what is the right regulation, rather than yes or no, should it be regulated? And that's the question many lawmakers will ask when Zuckerberg comes to Washington this week. And are you one of the 87 million Facebook users who had your data compromised? If you are, you'll find out later today. Uh, but first, let's get the latest BBC World News. I'm Stuart McIntosh with the BBC News. Hello. You're listening to News Daily. There's still to come. Could you be one of the 87 million people who get a message from Facebook later today saying your data was compromised after the political research firm Cambridge Analytica stole information from profiles to use for targeted political campaigning? We'll have more on that to come. But first... <laughs> Roughly 87 million people have had their Facebook state data stolen by the political research firm Cambridge Analytica. And starting today, Facebook will notify those people. Boss Mark Zuckerberg is then to appear before the Senate confronting combined outrage over the data theft, plus how Russia used Facebook to spread propaganda during the 2016 presidential election. Professor Siva Rajanathan is author of the book Anti-Social Media in the US and joins us now. Welcome to the program. I mean, first of all, this uh, Senate hearing, do you think uh, they will introduce new laws to somehow regulate Facebook? Yeah, it seems that several senators are interested in putting forth new legislation that might rein in Facebook to a degree, um, none of them seem to reach the level of protection uh, that European law will uh, afford um, as soon as the, uh, the GDPR kicks in in May. Uh, at that point, Europe will have much higher protection uh, for individuals. The, the companies that 
uh, do things, collect data from Europeans will have to uh, go through a number of very important steps to make sure that they're not misusing the data, that people understand very clearly what's going to happen with the data. Uh, there are you know, a number of very strong protections. The United States doesn't seem to be in the mood to protect its citizens at the level that the EU is willing so to. So you I feel that they really need that. that, that you, you feel they yeah. need extra protection, do they? Individuals uh, using Facebook and so on. I, I wouldn't even call it extra protection. I would call it a minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems pretty clear that Facebook has mistreated us, exploited us, misled us for more than a decade. Facebook or the, or the companies that um, it works with? Oh, Facebook. I mean, Facebook uh, for more than a, uh, well, let's see. Um, for most of the time that it's been operating. Operated with a, an explicit policy and practice that it never really hid, that it would allow developers, third-party developers, the developers that create games or applications or quizzes, to export massive amounts of data, not just about the people who chose to use those games or applications or quizzes, but all of their friends. So everything that Cambridge Analytica was able to acquire from Facebook Words with Friends was able to acquire, and Farmville was able to acquire. This was standard policy by Facebook right. for many years. Sure, but you, you've tweeted that you subscribe to various uh, papers, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and so on. They track and sell your data. Is that the oh, yeah. same thing going on? Uh, it is a lo lesser version of the same thing. So let's remember that while the New York Times has... Um, several million people reading its content every day, most of them read it on the web. Uh, Facebook has 2.2 billion users, so in terms of scale, it's so much more, the, uh, Facebook is so much more invasive and so much more complete in its domination of our attention. But in terms yes. of privacy oh. being broached, is it? Absolutely. I don't t look, the New York Times can track me as I move around the web and it can track what I look for on the New York Times site, but it doesn't know who my mother is, and it doesn't know who my sister is, and it doesn't know what, when and how often I speak with my friends from school. Those sorts of interactions, which say quite a bit about my associations, about my opinions, all of those things are Facebook's purview and no other company Very has briefly before you go, because we're running out of time, but uh, the, the senators just basically say we don't want to stop Facebook because right. it needs to make money. It's more that the senators are unwilling to do what it takes because it would require heavy lifting and it would require not only going up against Facebook but going up against telecommunication companies uh, and many other advertising companies in this country. So to do, to give us, those of us in the United States, the same sort of protections okay. that European citizens will have is asking too much of a U.S. Congress that is in no mood. It's in no mood. Okay, thank you ever so much for joining us. That's Professor Siva Vaijanathan, author of uh, Anti-Social Media. You're listening to me today. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg takes questions on Capitol Hill this week after reports of user data mishandled by a political firm. I think it's a watershed moment both for policymakers and technology companies. They are now realizing how little the public understands about how data and social media environments work. What's at stake as lawmakers examine how the tech world uses your data on the next morning edition. In prepared testimony, Zuckerberg says he takes full responsibility for not doing enough to prevent the site from being used as a platform for fake content and not acting quickly enough to thwart several Russian disinformation campaigns, including one during the 2016 presidential election. And that goes for fake news, for foreign interference in elections and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. His testimony was well received by the markets. Facebook shares closed 4.5% up. The European Commission... Regulate the social media site more closely. It's not enough to just connect people. We have to make sure that those connections are positive. It's not enough to just give people a voice. We need to make sure that people aren't using it to harm other people or to spread misinformation. And it's not enough to just give people control over their information. We need to make sure that the developers they share it with protect their information too. Across the board, we have a responsibility to not just build tools, 
but to make sure that they're used for good. Also, he said his company would continue to work uh, to try and work to make the world a better place. My top priority has always been our social mission of connecting people, building community, and bringing the world closer together. Advertisers and developers will never take priority over that as long as I'm running Facebook. I believe deeply in what we're doing, and I know that when we address these challenges, we'll look back and view helping people connect and giving more people a voice as a positive force in the world. And he apologized. Now, Russell Brandon is a senior reporter for the online technology site The Verge in New York. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Russell. What, did we learn anything new from his testimony today in front of the Senate committee? I don't know that we learned a lot of new information. I think there's been sort of a blitz of, of, of sort of information release in the week leading up to it, so I think they got everything out before, but I do think it was very enlightening to watch him stand up to this time, kind of scrutiny for basically the first time. Right, so was he impressive or was he a bit nervous? What? He was definitely more than a bit nervous, especially towards the end. I think... But also, this wasn't the disaster that, that some folks were worried about. I mean, you know, they've been trying to avoid having Zuckerberg in this position for, for a long time. And uh, he handled it sort of well enough, I think. And is there a, a reticence in the Senate to, de to deal with this um, because, I don't know, they're, they're Republican or, or simply because it's too complicated to work out how to stop the problems with Facebook? Well, I mean, I think... One way or another, the answer is regulating Facebook in some way. I mean, even Mark Zuckerberg said he's not against regulation. He just sort of cares about the details of it. Um, and, you know, I mean, in America, we've been deregulating industries for 40 years. That's what the, the government has. And, and this is not a Democrat or Republican thing. Like across the board, there's been a bipartisan consensus for, for deregulation of one kind or another as a positive good for, it, it, you know, an entire generation of politicians. So I think the idea that suddenly they need to make sure that this company, this sort of wonderful new tech sector that they don't fully understand, they need to take responsibility for it and try to keep it from damaging okay. society at large is something that they're really not, not only reluctant to take on, but they're not sure even how to do it. Right. I mean, there, there are a couple of issues, aren't there? There's a privacy breach and then there's these... Uh, fake news site set up by uh, people in Russia. Um, was it clear which one worries the Senate more and which one worries Zuckerberg more? Well, I would say there's even a third one, which is kind of the elephant in the room here, which is a question of monopoly. So the Senator Lindsey Graham asked well, quite up front, and I thought this was one of the best moments of the entire, uh, the entire testimony. He said, look, if I buy a Ford truck and I don't like it, I can go buy a Chevy truck. This is a very American analogy. He says, if I don't like Facebook, what do I do? What other Facebook can I use? And of course there is none because there are no Facebook competitors. It is the social network. And that really leads you to these questions of monopoly, which again, we have not in America had really robust antitrust measures for a very long time. We know what they look like. We've done it in history. It's just not something that the current government really knows how to do. So if it's just a data privacy question, then, all right, make sure that the other people on your network are following these policies. Make sure that the policies are up to snuff. It's a fairly simple fix comparatively. But if you start asking questions about monopoly, that goes to a place that Facebook really doesn't want to go. Okay, well, thanks very much. And especially with a company like Facebook, which is operating under an ongoing Federal Trade Commission consent decree from 2011. Well, yeah, it was supposed to be taking care of people's personal information. Let me ask, though, about what it is that Congress can do here. I know you've proposed various bills, uh, but I'll note that you're in the minority. You're a Democrat. When we spoke with Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook the other day, she noted there was really only one measure which seemed a little on the minor side, that, uh, to her anyway, that, that, that even has a slight chance of passing. Is there something that seriously has a chance of passing Congress that would in any way regulate a company like Facebook? Um, well, I think, again, that this is a, a new era. I don't think we can any longer think about this the way we did before this revelation. Uh, I'm the author of the Child Online Privacy Act of 1999. That's the Constitution for the Protection of Information of Children Online. Uh, that is for children 12 and under. Uh, I think it should be updated to under 16. Uh, I think that uh, parents 
So, and, and children should have a right to say no to these companies that they absolutely don't want their children's information to be reused uh, for purposes other than that which the parents and the children intended. I can't believe that Facebook and others would say no, that children shouldn't have protections, but that industry has opposed protections for even children uh, over the past decade. Uh, but I think that it's going to extend to adults as well. I think that there's going to be some uh, a, a desire to have consent, to have opt-in be the standard uh, for the years ahead. Well, that's, just, that's interesting. Was, opt-in meaning you would only have your data used in strange ways if you affirmatively said yes to that. Because time is brief, I want to ask about one other thing. The bill that Sheryl Sandberg did mention uh, actually was, was your bill, I believe. It's called the Honest Ads Act. It's supposed to make it easier for us to find out who's paying for political ads online. Facebook now says it's going to do that on its own. Uh, in a few seconds, can this company self-regulate in this or any other area? Uh, yeah, that's a bill which Amy Globachar and others have um, have introduced. I, I don't think um, that it can be voluntary. I don't think any of this can be voluntary. I think it has to be mandatory. It has to be across the entire uh, uh, industry because it's just not one company, Facebook, but it would be any other site as well. In each one of these areas, we can't be dependent upon the uh, the voluntary compliance of individual companies. There has to be a law. Senator Ben Markey of Massachusetts, thanks very much. No, you're welcome. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Uh, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. So our responsibility now is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The company has also unveiled new privacy tools ahead of Zuckerberg's testimony today. For more, we go to Los Angeles, California, where we're joined by David Dayan, a contributor to The Intercept and columnist for The New Republic. His recent piece include ban targeted advertising, and the U.S. government is finally scrambling to regulate Facebook. So, David, talk about the significance of, um, well, you've read he's pre-released his statement, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, what has happened at Facebook and what needs to be done? Well, it's very significant that Mark Zuckerberg is appearing before Congress today. This is uh, the first time that he's done so, and uh, Congress has really not kept up with uh, the, the revolution happening online and as far as social media and these companies are concerned. And uh, they, they've sort of given over the playing field of, of regulation to Facebook, companies like Facebook, and which have become really almost private governments that are, are making these monumental decisions uh, based on their business model uh, that have wide-ranging effects for elections, for uh, the, the viability of businesses, for uh, you know, the, the, the uh, mass uh, problems that we see in places like Burma and the Philippines. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's really consequential. And so what we see today is really Congress trying to sort of catch up to where they should be and should have been for a long time, seeing that these companies are incredibly powerful, incredibly large, and, and require uh, a, a democratic uh, impulse to step in and, and, and make some changes. Well, David, you heard uh, Zuckerberg talk about how this is a mistake, a terrible mistake, but the reality is this is the model. This is the way that Facebook makes money, being able to monetize the, uh, the activity of, of the people on their network. Uh, this whole issue of the failure of congressional leaders to adequately regulate the development of the internet the way they did uh, television, the way they did other forms of communication technology, the telephone, uh, and the pri basically the privatization of the most important means of communication uh, that we have in the world today. I'm, uh, what was the responsibility of Congress that should have been uh, earlier on uh, tackling this problem? Right, Congress absolutely should have stepped in much sooner uh, than now when, when we've already seen this problem. Obviously, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, Facebook uh, and, and Google and other, other uh, social media sites make money off of exploiting the data of their users. Uh, their, their, their users aren't really the customers, they are the product, as it's often said. 
And, uh, you know, this has implications for privacy laws, it has implications for anti-discrimination laws, it obviously has implications for our elections, and uh, these are all ways in which uh, the, the, the government needs to get involved and, and come up with some, some real standards to protect people. And, and in, in their absence, Facebook has sort of uh, done this on their own whim, really on the whim of one person, Mark Zuckerberg. On Thursday, NBC's Savannah Guthrie interviewed Facebook COO, the Chief Operating Officer, Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, let's go to a clip. Could you come up with a tool that said, I do not want Facebook to use my personal profile data to target me for advertising? Could you have an opt-out button? Please don't use my profile data for advertising. We have different forms of opt-out. We don't have an opt-out at the highest level. That would be a, a, a paid product. David Day and respond to this and talk about how um, what happened with Cambridge Analytica harvesting what and now they're telling us 87 million uh, Facebook users could have been prevented. Well, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, and talk about her saying this would be a paid product. Yeah, Cheryl Sanders says uh, that that you would only have to be able to pay uh, uh, if if you're you're opting out completely of advertising. This this is uh, seemingly ridiculous. Facebook has two billion. Uh, uh, members of an audience. If a television station or a radio station had, had that kind of massive audience, I think they'd figure out a way to make money with advertising without harvesting the data of every single person. Uh, we, we went through uh, many decades in this country without targeted advertising. I think we can go back to that. Uh, the, the, the idea of an opt-out button is very similar to what the regime uh, that is being constructed in Europe uh, it's called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and it would require affirmative consent from people to have their data collected and sold to advertisers or used in the targeting of advertising. And, and, and I think that uh, there are more and more people in Washington who are seeing that as a viable method to uh, protect citizens. However, it's, it's very consent-based. Uh, we could do something stronger uh, and, and, and just opt out and certainly get rid of this, this idea that uh, if you're, one of your friends on Facebook takes a quiz, that they, uh, that company that, that put the quiz together gets access to all of your profile data, which is exactly what happened in the Cambridge Analytica situation. Only about 270,000 Facebook users took that quiz. But because they got the derivative data of all the friends of those people, 87 million at least, I mean, that's the number they're using now, 87 million users had their data harvested and then put to use in political targeting. So, uh, well, uh, you know, David, we, we that, need to really get a handle on this. I don't think Facebook has a, a handle on it necessarily. They have millions of advertisers. They don't know what uh, any, any one advertiser is doing from one moment to the next. Uh, this, this is a, a problem of a company that's really too big to manage and uh, government needs to step in with some clear rules around uh, what is allowable. But David, specifically on that issue of all the, the, all of the profiles that were harvested as a result of this voluntary quiz by only a few hundred thousand people, are there legal questions there as, uh, for uh, or potential lawsuits uh, by those people whose data was harvested without their participating at all uh, in any kind of, of, uh, of a survey? Well, lawsuits have already been filed. Uh, I think there are eight consumer lawsuits, uh, class action lawsuits. Uh, we'll see how they work their way through the courts. Certainly, there are violations involved in a lot of this kind of uh, targeting that we see. Uh, there's a, a lawsuit right now being put forward by uh, housing advocates uh, showing that uh, advertisers used Facebook tools to create housing and employment advertisements that uh, necessarily avoided African Americans and Hispanics from seeing the ads. And, and that seemingly you know, violates fair housing, fair employment laws. Uh, there are all sorts of applications that you can use when you can get down to that granular level and know, you know practically everything about the individual to whom you're serving that ad. It, it has all sorts of legal implications, and uh, that's why, you know, I mean, I think we're, what we're going to see today in Congress is a lot of grandstanding, but I think behind the scenes, uh, there are people really seriously thinking through this, 
and, and trying to come up with a way of dealing with these companies that have gotten so large, that have such large troves of data that are you know, almost inherently insecure, that offer so many tools to advertisers. What are the implications of that? And uh, it, it's something, it's a place government needs to be involved. Otherwise, we have regulation by Facebook, a private government that uh, is only really concerned with their own financial interests. Should Facebook be nationalized? Uh, that, that's something that has been brought up by uh, commentators. I think it's an interesting uh, way to go about it, to, to think about it, to, to regulate it as a public utility. Uh, there, there are ideas of uh, you know, things like interoperability where you would be able to take your sort of social media graph to any competing site. Uh, this is what was done with uh, AOL Instant Messenger uh, way back in uh, the turn of uh, uh, the century. Uh, and it, it enabled uh, text messaging to, to sort of migrate away from this one site. Uh, right now we have uh, the situation where uh, 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 Facebook owns Instagram. Facebook owns WhatsApp. Anytime there's a competitor to Facebook, they either buy it or they ape the uh, uh, technology that's used within it like they did with Snapchat. Uh, this is a, an antitrust problem uh, that I, I think requires some solutions around that. And also I think there needs to be very broad privacy regulations that uh, understand you know, uh, that, that individuals that come to a site do, do not consent or, or, or they, they do not have the expectation that everything that they've ever written, everything that they've ever put on that site is going to be used in targeting them. Well, uh, that, this, is, this, is, this is the kinds of things we can do. David Day, I want to thank you very much for being with us. And we'll bring you excerpts of uh, Zuckerberg's testimony tomorrow in Congress and commentary. Wearing a dark blue suit and a light blue tie, Mark Zuckerberg looked uncomfortable as he tried to explain himself during this long-awaited interrogation from senators. Mr. Zuckerberg rejected claims Facebook enjoyed a monopoly, and when asked if he was considering charging users to access the service instead of selling ads, he did not rule it out. He said there would always be a version of Facebook that would be free. He described the challenge of staying ahead of Russian misinformation techniques as an arms race. Investors seemed impressed with Mr. Zuckerberg's performance. Shares were up 4.5% at the close of trading. Well, the founder of Facebook has warned against over-regulating social media in the wake of a scandal over the misappropriation of users' personal data. Mark Zuckerberg faced almost five hours of questioning by a U.S. Senate committee. Dave Lee reports. The verdict from day one of Mark Zuckerberg's testimony was that he may have appeared nervous, but ultimately came out looking focused, capable, and mostly unscathed by senators' questioning. But as the House gets its chance to question him later today, we can expect more debate on possible regulation. So far, Mr Zuckerberg has said he regrets not informing users affected by the Cambridge Analytica scandal sooner. He likened the challenge of fending off Russian misinformation on Facebook to an arms race. With Facebook's very business model in question, Mark Zuckerberg did not rule out one day charging people to use the network, though he insisted there would always be a free version. So Mark Zuckerberg was kind of grilled yesterday by a, a lot of senators for a good number of hours. How do you think he did? So I think that Mark's performance was fine. I think the issue with the entire hearing was that the senators brought up at least a dozen different issues before I lost count, every one of which was serious, you know, ranging from civil rights issues to civil liberties issues to election interference to, you know, identity theft, etc. Every one of them was the result of Facebook's business model. That is to say, conscious choices made by Facebook in order to maximize its growth. And where Mark, I think, had returned to Washington this time in year 14 or 15 of what has been a never-ending apology tour. You know, the company's motto of move fast and break things mm -hmm. has a little postscript of apologize and then go back to business as though nothing had ever happened. You think that's what's happening here? You think he's apologizing in, in Congress and, and then plans to go back to business as usual? Because he seemed, I mean, he, he said he, he's committed to, to changing, he's open to regulation. I mean, he, he certainly made it sound like he's, he's ready to act. You're not convinced. No, and I think that Mark believes that he's willing to do those things. But this is a very, very large company up against a Congress that at the moment is struggling just to get budgets passed. I think passing regulation through our legislative body right now is going to be a 
long and very difficult process. It favors the incumbent, in this case, Facebook. And so I think from his point of view, there's no cost to being diplomatic. And, you know, the reality is that Facebook has become too large. And in its huge scale, they really have no idea what's going on inside the platform around the world. You know, I think they were genuinely surprised to discover that the terror going on in Myanmar against the Rohingya minority was being enabled by Facebook. I think they were genuinely surprised that in the Philippines, the regime there uses Facebook to legitimize things like death squads. I mean, I think that kind of stuff actually has caught them by surprise. But I also don't think there's anything that they can do about it without changing their business model. And I think they're very reluctant to do that. You, you think Mark Zuckerberg is not willing to change the basic business model if that's what it takes to protect people and, and rein in his company? Well, I think he will look for any alternative before changing the business model. And are there alternatives that, that might protect users short of changing the business model? I think the great difficulty here is they've created one of the most profitable, successful businesses in history. And they are, you know, understandably reluctant to change that. Facebook, for all the good it does and all the beautiful things that go on inside the product, Facebook has become a real threat to democracy. I think it's become a threat to civil liberties around the world and to civil rights in many parts of the United States. And I just think that counting on Facebook to fix these things is a fool's errand. Couldn't you argue that there are some possible solutions? I mean, for example, in Europe, there are laws being considered where users would have to opt in if their data was going to be shared. And, and if there were fixes like that, wouldn't you get to a point where even if you believe that Facebook is a threat to democracy, um, people are, are deciding to, to be on this platform and using it voluntarily, and, and their, their information is only going to be shared if they allow it. And if they don't think it's a threat to democracy, then, then the company can go on. No, David, you know, that is a brilliant point. What my job in this entire thing has been to try to stimulate a national conversation about what is the appropriate role of social media. In Europe, the global data protection regulation, which you're describing, goes into effect May 25th. It protects Europeans no matter where they are in the world, even when they're in the United States. A perfect outcome relative to data privacy would be if Facebook and Google and others were to embrace the global data protection regulation. I think it's very unlikely that the U.S. Congress is going to get something like that through quickly. You know, I think we're going to have to have some changes in leadership, but I think that would be a wonderful direction. What worries me is we have an election coming up in a matter of months, and Facebook has done almost nothing to prevent a reoccurrence of what happened in 2016. And from my perspective, that's disappointing. And I say this as someone who spent years mentoring Mark Zuckerberg and uh, introducing him to Sheryl Sandberg back uh, in 2007. And so I look at this with great regret, but also, you know, an understanding that this isn't my call. I'm just trying to help people understand what the trade-offs are. Roger McNamee, thanks so much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Zuckerberg's testimony was motivated largely by reports that research firm Cambridge Analytica improperly gained access to data from 87 million Facebook users, used that information, and shared it with an unknown list of third parties. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, for interference in elections, and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. And this is the takeaway. We face a number of important issues. All right, Senator, so a number of things I think are, are important here. Good and important question here. There are a number of important points. The most important, Senator, the most important thing is a really important one, extremely important. Senator, I think that that's an important principle. Senator, those, those are all important questions. Yes, Senator, uh, I think that that's very important. Important conversation, important points in there. Senator, this is actually a very important question here. Mark Zuckerberg got some good advice on how to face lawmakers in congressional testimony. Always validate their questions. They really like that. 
Mark Zuckerberg is before the House Energy and Commerce Committee today where he faces more important questions about how and when information was shared and to what effect. Edmund Lee has been following all of it. He's managing editor for Recode, and he joins me now in the studio. Edmund, thanks for being here. Good to be here. Well, I want to start from yesterday. Look, this was a long session of hearings, Mark Zuckerberg, in front of senators. But I want to start with this exchange between Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat of Illinois, and Mark Zuckerberg. Listen. Would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um... <laughs> No. If you messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that might be what this is all about. Your right to privacy, the limits of your right to privacy, and how much you give away in modern America in the name of, quote, connecting people around the world. Uh, Edmund, Dick Durbin is an old prosecutor himself, and he has a way of getting to the point. He says that's what this is all about, your right to privacy. Do you agree? Yeah. No, it, he, he did a great job of illustrating in very concrete terms what this means, what's at stake. At the same time, I think what Mark Zuckerberg had sort of stressed throughout the testimony, five plus hours, is that you have control, you decide what you want to share. So in other words, if you didn't want to say where, where you stayed in the hotel, you didn't have to, but if you have to mention it, it's fair game. I think that's where there's the fine line of, well, if I'm saying where I stayed, does that mean that you know advertisers can see that and try to sell me ads for other places I could stay? I think that's where it starts to get a little wonky. Look, we all know this is about privacy, Edmund, but before users can make good decisions about privacy, there has to be transparency, right? I mean, one of the fundamental questions here is whether all of the many hundreds of millions of us who use Facebook know the rules of the road when we click the privacy settings and we know what can be done with our data, whether it's opt-in or opt-out. Here's Senator Richard Blumenthal, another old prosecutor, by the way. He's a Democrat from Connecticut, and he took a swing at this transparency question. Would you agree that users should be able to access all of their information? Senator, yes, of course. All the information that you collect as a result of purchases from data brokers, as well as tracking them. Senator, we have already a download your information tool that allows people to see and to take out all of the information that Facebook, that they've put into Facebook or that Facebook knows about them. So yes, I agree with that. We already have that. Now, Evan, we're going to talk about that download tool in just a minute, but what about transparency? There's a consent decree over Facebook already. Uh, that goes back, I think, to 2011. I might have that wrong. That's right. Uh, yeah. look, when we log on to Facebook, uh, is it clear to regular old users like me about what Facebook can do with my data and what they can't? Almost certainly it's not clear for pretty much all of us. No one's reading these terms of service. They're thousands of words long, uh, written in a, in a style that it's, it's hard to penetrate. So, yeah, it's, it's a fair point that a lot of the senators made yesterday Terms of service are not clear, which basically means, you know, it's not transparent. It's you're obfuscating. I mean, it's, it's a legal protection for Facebook, of course, but in plain language, what I do with this, what can happen with what you say on Facebook, most users are sure to not know about that. And I think that's, again, uh, what they were trying to get at. Now, Mark Zuckerberg says Facebook has a download tool where you can download all of the data that Facebook has available on you. We've been asking listeners all week to do that. I've done it. So if people have their data in front of them now, uh, what are they looking at? They're looking at sort of their whole log of their whole history of what they've done on Facebook, photos they've uploaded, messages they've exchanged with people, events that they, they've agreed to go to, um, but also most curiously, the advertisers that have been targeting them. You know, in, uh, Whether it was something that they interacted with or something that they liked, um, that signal, that data point then, you know, sort of went out to advertisers uh, that might be interested and said, hey, you should look at this. And I think that for a lot of people is probably the most interesting part of that download. Um, and it's for me, my, my own personal log, it's, it's largely unremarkable. I'm not the most active on Facebook, but certainly posted photos and spoke, spoken to friends and family like most other people. Yeah, it's a, it's a history of what I've done and what I've looked at. There are definitely some interesting things, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, had some something similar in terms of the advertisers that have been targeting me. And it was interesting just to see that some you know some had nothing to do with 
with what I you know what I'm interested in, uh, like a ski vacation, for example. Certainly gone skiing in the past, but maybe a handful of times. It's not something I do regularly. Uh, and I think a lot of sort of anecdotally, a lot of other people I've spoken with had similar reactions. I had no idea that this advertiser thought I'd be interested in them. I don't think that's harmful so much as it's just a failure of their algorithm. And you know, it's a curiosity more than anything else. Well, let's talk about that list of advertisers and what people will find in this data when they download it. I'm not terribly active on Facebook either. I think I use it maybe in the same way that you do, Edmund. Uh, but I downloaded my data and the photos are easy to follow, the messages are too, but I found the rest of it kind of jumbled and a little bit confusing, especially that list of advertisers. It was a little hard to discern how many there were, uh, who they were, and, and exactly what they knew about me. Specifically also, what action that you took, what was it that you either said or liked or whatever it might have been that led that, you know, to that signal for that advertisement. I think that the lack of transparency around that is certainly an issue. You know, I, I, I think ultimately Facebook wants that to be transparent so that they can get the algorithm better. Now, what about games, Edmund? A lot of attention has been drawn to games and gaming apps on Facebook. I'll, I'll confess, I use Facebook primarily these days to play online Scrabble. It's a bit of an obsession of mine, and it is through Facebook. I got a little bit concerned when all of this broke that my Scrabble habit was exposing me to uh, data miners or people I didn't want to have my information. What about games in general? Games, in a lot of ways, are sort of the foundation of the activity on Facebook. If you go way back when, games are still an essential part. But it's the right question to ask because of what happened with Cambridge Analytica. It's entirely possible Games have harvested some of your data, and it's fine for them to do, given the terms of service that, you know, the developer agreement that Facebook has with them, the hard part is going to be determining, well, have these game developers shared that data with someone else? And that's what happened with Cambridge Analytica. We're talking about downloading your data and what you saw, which kind of advertisers you've reacted with. That download won't tell you if a third party had somehow sold your data off or, or used it for a different purpose. So again, there's not enough information there, there's not enough transparency there. Facebook is addressing that, of course, they acknowledge that. Um, but yes, it's definitely player beware <laughs> if you're playing games, for sure. Well, let's talk about one of the other giant issues hanging over all of this. Whenever somebody like Mark Zuckerberg goes in front of an institution like Congress, will Congress turn around and decide that this internet juggernaut needs to be regulated a lot more than it's regulated right now? Here's Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina. What would you tell people in South Carolina that given all the things we've just discovered here, it's a good idea for us to rely upon you to regulate your own business practices? Well, Senator, my position is not that there should be no regulation. Okay. I think the Internet is increasing the embrace regulation. I, I think the real question, as the Internet becomes more important in people's lives, is what is the right regulation, not whether there should but, be but or you as a company, would you work with us in terms of what regulations you think are necessary in your industry? Absolutely. Well, Edmund, look, Facebook has an army of lobbyists in Washington now. They're not just a tiny company in Silicon Valley. They got a lot of money. They make a lot of campaign contributions. Is Congress going to have the courage and the technical expertise to really seriously regulate uh, these problems of data sharing and what users know about Facebook? I think um, it, it, there certainly isn't a political will. I think, to your second point, technical expertise, I think that is going to be <laughs> the big question mark in terms of, you know, it, it requires a real sophisticated understanding of how these systems work that would require either good regulation or whether it's legislation even in the future. And, you know, it, it needs to sort of stand the test of time as well. It can't be something that, you know, you enshrine today that is irrelevant in six months or a year. Uh, and again, that, that's going to come down to technical expertise. Of course, Congress has its lawyers, has its experts. Facebook has its lobbyists, its experts, and they're going to haggle over that. So chances are that they're going to have a good discussion around it. But again, it's something that even Facebook itself isn't always aware of in terms of how their system works or how things will react. So much of it is driven by software and algorithms. They don't even always know the outcome. And maybe, Evan, the next time we have you on, uh, we have to bring along an expert in the history of monopolies and maybe the power of lobbying in Washington, D.C. Because like I said, Facebook is a giant now, and if people want to call it a monopoly or crack down with regulations, uh, they're going to fight back ultimately. As Mark Zuckerberg said, they're willing to, to engage in some kind of regulation, but we will only go so far. If it comes to the point where it really hurts their business, they're going to draw a red line and say, well, not beyond that point. Edmund Lee, man, 
Managing Editor for Recode. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Well, Commissioner, I mean, one of the big questions we were just addressing a minute ago was whether American politicians are essentially going to have the courage to regulate Facebook. And, and in Europe, it seems like they've already mustered that courage. Well, in Europe, there is a different approach. It's called the General Data Protection Regulation. It comes into effect in May. And they're also considering broader e-privacy legislation. It's a different approach than the U.S. approach in that it's really grounded in giving individual users more control and rights to their data. So it allows for individual users, for example, to have more opportunities to say yes or no when their data is being processed by third parties. It includes rights to be informed about how data is being processed, rights to object to that kind of data processing, data portability, data minimization, privacy by design by default. A lot of these concepts, I'd love to point out, are privacy ideas that the Federal Trade Commission and privacy advocates have been advocating for here in the United States as well for a very long time. Now, how many of these protections, or even the spirit of these protections, are on the books, either in law or in regulation here in the United States now? Well, in the United States, we really do rely more on a framework that protects consumers from deception, which means you have to tell consumers and get their consent for data collection and use especially sensitive categories of data. And what's different about what Europe is proposing is the rights really do begin and end with the, with the user. So it's a, it's a framework that gives more rights to individual users than perhaps we have in U.S. law. I mean, I think it's important to say that, that there are some aspects that Congress should pay attention to when thinking about how to better protect Americans' data control and privacy and security, but it may not be practical to totally copy and cut and paste the GDPR into U.S. law because we have different institutions and, and different legal frameworks here, and we have things like the First Amendment, which are very important, um, that, that need to be valued as well. So talk a little bit about the user experience when they're confronting questions of their own privacy, I don't know, let's say in France or Germany, in the EU. One of the big questions that came up in hearings yesterday was the idea of opt-in versus opt-out when it's a question of data security. How does that play? This is a, a key question, and for a very long time, the Federal Trade Commission, which is my agency in the United States, has advocated for clear consent and opt-in choices for users when their sensitive information is being collected and processed in some way. Sensitive information includes health information, financial information, children's information. Uh, it also includes geolocation and content of communications. The, the idea there is to say, look, there, there are categories of information that you really need to be giving consumers clear, timely opt-in choices around. What is in the GDPR framework is very similar. It just is a stronger legal requirement. Well, Commissioner, the FTC offices in Washington are just at the foot of Capitol Hill, not far away at all. So as you've been gazing up Capitol Hill at the House and the Senate, but what have you seen over the last year or two about lawmakers' willingness to talk about really regulating Facebook? Well, I think this is a watershed moment. I am encouraged to see a real conversation happening around the kinds of consumer protections that I think consumers need for our highly connected digital world that we live in. We're, we're finally having a conversation at the congressional level, not just about the tools that an agency like the Federal Trade Commission needs, and I think it needs more authority and more tools to protect consumers, but also things like data portability, giving U.S. consumers the same rights that European consumers will have to control their data, to move their data around, and, and to really own their data in a way that, that we currently don't have. I think that's terrific. I also think we need to be having a conversation, and, and I hope we will continue to have this conversation, about increased transparency and accountability for data brokers, there are tons of third parties that you as an individual don't have a direct relationship with that have vast amounts of information about you and are selling those pieces of data. And I think we need to have more transparency and ability to interact with that information as well. Transparency is, is also a key piece of the GDPR framework because it really allows individual users to make sure they can access the information and data that are held about them and uh, know who's using it and for what purposes.
Carolyn Sweeney, Commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission since 2014. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you. No, are you willing to change your business model in the interest of protecting individual privacy? Congresswoman, I'm not sure what that means. Well, maybe we can help here. Facebook sells ads against what it knows its users to be interested in. One way, maybe the way, that they figure out what you're interested in is the like button, that little thumbs up. It may well be the most powerful tool in social media. Every single time we click on it, we narrow ourselves down beautifully for advertisers and researchers and others. And the very nature of what that button stands for, the validation that a whole lot of people get from it, keeps us coming back for more. Marketplace's Rima Crace explains that one. Before you and I knew it as the like button, Facebook developers had another name for it, the awesome button. It's one of those things that was lost in history. So Leo Cuervo helped design the feature about a decade ago. Also lost in history, he says before the blue thumbs up, they experimented with a star symbol, a plus sign. He says the feature kept failing so-called Zuck reviews. We used to call it the, the curse of, of the awesome button because the, the project felt a little bit cursed. It just always seemed to get stuck in review. Corvo, who now owns a design and venture firm, says that's partly because developers were scared that the like or awesome button would make people lazy, that it would lead to less posting. They were dead wrong. Rather than cannibalizing comments, it did the opposite. It, it created an environment in which people were more motivated to leave posts. The like button officially left product purgatory in 2009, and since then we've seen iterations of that little iconic symbol all over social media, including on this popular app owned by Facebook. Um, this is my Instagram. Oh, I got a like. Who is it? I don't know who this person is. In Los Angeles, outside a mall with her friend, 23-year-old Gabby Weir scrolls through her Instagram. She shows me pictures of her mimosa-filled brunches at cliff sides in Italy, lots of selfies, and under each carefully worded caption, dozens of likes. I think like my median like is like, I don't know, 115. And she says sometimes if a picture doesn't perform, she'll take it down. Still, Weir says how many likes she gets, not really important. Her friend standing next to her, Amber Tolliver, gives her the side eye. But I really couldn't care less what people think of me. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, it's true. I definitely, I don't care what people think of me in terms of like, how, do you know, how would you know how many likes that you're getting? Like, why would you even think about it if it, di if it didn't matter to you? Like, no, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. <laughs> so it does matter. The thing is, it matters to a lot of people. The reason the like button has been so successful is because people, well, they like to be liked, says Adam Alter, a marketing professor at NYU. The experience of getting a like is a lot like, uh, like a drug taken by someone who's addicted to the drug. It's, it's just a massive dose of reward. It's a huge boost to well-being. Alter says the like button is what makes social media platforms so irresistible, sort of like a slot machine. You never know how well a post is going to do, so you keep going back. That's how the attention economy works. It's critical that people keep devoting their attention to that particular platform. Otherwise, it loses its key source of revenue. Money, he says, is not the currency here. Our personal data is. The more time we spend on the platform, the more data we're handing over to advertisers. And when we like things on Facebook, we're making their jobs easier. Say I like Lady Gaga on Facebook. I wouldn't really, but if I did, then I could expect to see ads maybe for her concert on my newsfeed. That's not an entirely new concept, says Sandra Matz, a professor of organizational behavior at Columbia University.